Everybody, who's going to have your attention to get started? Good morning, everyone. My name is Max Latona. I'm the executive director of the Center for Ethics and Society at San Antonio College. It's my honor to welcome all of you, uh, both in person and uh, online, uh, to this morning's event entitled Residential Building Regulations in New Hampshire, Causes and Consequences. Um, I'd like to note that this morning's event is co-hosted by the Center for Ethics in Society, as well uh, as, uh, as well as the Josiah Bartlett Center for Public Policy. We are grateful uh, to the Bartlett Center for their collaboration and for their support. Uh, the event is also made possible in part by support from New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority as part of their ongoing uh, support of the center's housing VD initiative. Uh, we're grateful to them as well. So in a moment, um, I will introduce my counterpart from the Bartlett Center, uh, who will have a few words to say and will serve as moderator for today's event. Uh, before I do so, uh, I'd like to take a brief moment to remind us all of why uh, we're here in this room or uh, online, as it were. Um, New Hampshire can accurately be described to be having a housing crisis, extreme shortage of housing, but also problem of affordability. Since wherever there is high demand and a shortage of supply, of course, there is an inflation of prices. The pain caused by this housing crisis is widespread and it is growing. Businesses cannot attract the workforce they need. Our adult children who wish to live on their own in our communities cannot afford an apartment to rent. Growing families cannot find adequate living space and our aging seniors cannot downsize, to name just a few of the unhappy effects of the shortage. Now I'm not an economist, but I remember enough from my lessons to know that normally when goods rise in prices, enterprising folk get busy manufacturing the goods to meet the demand. They have an incentive to do so because of the higher prices. And eventually, as the supply increases, prices start to normalize. But why isn't this happening to housing? Why are accessory dwelling units, apartments, and townhouses, and single family homes not suddenly being built in greater supply? You don't need to look too far for the answer. The answer is right under our own noses in the form of overly restrictive residential land use regulations that govern housing development in our own communities. In effect, uh, where an insufficient supply of housing is being built because we're not letting these houses be built. Now, the Center for Ethics and Society is concerned about this because this is, among other things, an issue of ethics. Human beings have a lot of moral duties, but one of them is clear, and it's a duty of non-interference. For example, if there are hungry people in our community, we can debate whether each of us has a moral responsibility to help by donating food or serving at the soup kitchen, or otherwise. I happen to think we do have duties here, but uh, I'm not pressing that point. But one thing is certain, we have an absolute duty not to stand in the way of other people who are donating food or serving in the soup kitchen. The idea is, look, if you don't want to help, that's one thing, but just don't get in the way of other people who are trying to help. Arguably, that's what's happening with housing in New Hampshire. We can debate our, our moral responsibility individually in terms of actively helping people who are suffering from a lack of housing. 
helping the homeless, building an ADU in our attached garage. But there's one thing that's certain. We have an absolute duty to avoid preventing other people who are trying to help. So that is arguably what our restrictive land use regulations are doing. They're not only neglecting to do something to solve the housing problem, they're actively stopping other members of our own communities from building homes to solve the problem. So I would argue that restrictive land use regulations are a clear violation of our duty of non interference. Okay, that's enough from me. I do want to say that in terms of what's going to happen today, to give you a sense, both online and in person. Um, after um, I introduce uh, uh, my counterpart at the Barton Center, he's going to say a few words, and then um, he will introduce our main speaker for today. Um, after we hear from our main speaker, uh, about 20 minutes, uh, at about 10.40, there'll be a question and answer period for about five minutes for both people in person and as well as on online. Those of you online will be able to ask your questions using the Q&A chat, and Hannah Beaudry, our program coordinator, will relay your questions uh, to our, our main speaker. Um, after that Q&A ends, there'll be a stimulating panel discussion uh, moderated by um, my counterpart at the Department Center and with two special guests who we will um, be introduced to in a moment. And after that uh, panel discussion, about 20 minutes or so, at 11.05, there'll be another period of question and answer from the audience as well as online for about five, 10 minutes. And then our program will end promptly at 11.15. So once again, I wanna thank all of you uh, for coming and attending today. And um, I, hope, I hope this event gives you something to, uh, to think about. And now with, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my counterpart from the Bartlett Center, Andrew Klein. He's the president of the Josiah Bartlett Center for Public Policy. Before joining the Bartlett Center, he was a communications consultant and a newspaper editor. Uh, he spent 14 years as editor of the editorial page of the New Hampshire Union Leader, where his work won him two New Hampshire Press Association Editorial Writer of the Year Awards. A USA Today contributor, he has been published in more than 100 newspapers and magazines, including The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, National Review, and The Weekly Standard. He was appointed chair of the State Board of Education in 2017. Drew? Thanks. I, uh, I can't say it better than Max did, so I'm not going to belabor his points on, uh, on land use regulations and why we're here. I just want to thank the Center for Ethics and Society for partnering with us on this. I feel like um, Barlow Center has been writing about housing for a few years now, and I think we do a pretty strong job. But it really um, helps our mission and it helps get the word out and it helps people understand when we can find organizations to partner with and have simple views on things that um, who can uh, you know, help us reach new audiences and, uh, and give us the gravitas that comes with having you guys involved, which is great. So the Barlow Center, for those of you who don't know, um, we're a free market think tank. Our mission is to advance, uh, advance free market public policies that promote prosperity and opportunity. For all grant payers. We have started to take a look at housing. I mean, you might know our work from mostly on state budget and state regulatory issues. We started to take a look at housing because it fits perfectly within our mission. We, we do look for free market solutions to problems that are caused by government regulation. And <clears throat> this is a clear example of government regulation preventing the market from working properly and satisfying people's needs. And so we wanted to get more involved in that. And we asked uh, Jason if he'd be interested in doing a study for us. And the, the reason we reached out to Jason is because he's not only one of the smartest guys in New Hampshire, he's really meticulous and careful. And that was really important for us. We wanted to do a good study, a serious study, not something that was slipshod and thrown together and sort of reached a conclusion we all kind of wanted to reach. We wanted uh, to actually know what was really going on in New Hampshire. And I think the study that Jason did uh, really does that. He controls for all sorts of effects that you want to control for. And I will let him explain the results, but it's very strong. We're very proud of this study. It's the first of its kind that we know of in New Hampshire to take a look at land use regulations in this way. And to, to then take a look at the local communities and see which ones are most restrictive for housing. And our whole purpose in doing this is to find solutions. So we don't want to just complain. We don't want to just point fingers. We want to give citizens some tools and some suggestions um, to try to solve this problem. Step one in solving the problem is identifying what the problem 
And that's why we hired Jason. Um, there's a lot of talk we've been talking about in New Hampshire need for new housing for 30, 40 years now. Look back to the um, 1970s, Governor Thompson, Mel Thompson got involved in trying to figure out housing issues. It's been that long. And what we found was a lot of people talk about housing, um, but don't know why the shortage exists, can't identify the issue, can't figure it out. And so we wanted to provide um, a paper that would identify the problem and then offer some suggested solutions so we could start to move forward and really address this problem at the local and state level. So um, with that, I'll introduce Jason Sorens, who's director for the Center for Ethics and Society. He's got a PhD in political science. Um, as I said, one of the smartest guys around. We're very proud that he was able to do the study with us and um, we'll let him take it from here. So welcome and thanks everybody. Thanks so much, Drew, and I uh, appreciate your reaching out to me a couple of years ago to do this study and uh, and getting the opportunity to uh, permanently disqualify myself from serving on the Amherst Planning Board. Which is where I live. But um, be that as it may, I will try to be a uh, part of the uh, of the solution rather than the problem. So there's there's a lot of the study that I'm not going to be able to to cover um, in this presentation. Um, so please do uh, take a look at it. Is it on jbartlett.org now? It is. Okay, so you can check it out online if you didn't get a, a print copy. Um, but I'm going to give you some of the highlights here. So um, there are a few research questions that I wanted to address with this study. Number one is, why have house prices and the rents for rental properties uh, increased so much in New Hampshire, especially over the last two decades? Uh, and the answer here, spoiler alert, is that it's mostly residential land use regulation. And this is consistent with what uh, economists have found nationwide. And number two, uh, which New Hampshire municipalities have restricted housing supply the most? And this is a, an interesting question that we have had trouble answering in the past. And so I'm going to present uh, some uh, data on this uh, that will, will, I view as the beginning of um, good research on, on seeing where the problem uh, is most severe. And number three, what are the consequences of restricted housing supply for our communities? Um, you know, what, is the, what is the effect on New Hampshire society and the economy? And then finally, why do New Hampshire municipalities adopt anti-growth policies? So in summary, what are the consequences of land use regulation uh, and what are the causes of it? Uh, and finally, what can we do about it? I'll conclude with a few suggested policy recommendations. So first of all, well, what is uh, land use regulation? Land use regulation can take many forms and can uh, restrict housing supply in many different ways. Um, one um, very common and important way that uh, land use regulation can affect uh, housing construction is through zoning in which a municipality's territory is divided into districts and different land uses are allowed in different districts. There may be different types of regulations on uh, on what uh, what you can do uh, with your with your property in terms of building a house. Maybe you have to have uh, a certain number of acres um, before you're allowed to to build a house on that land. Uh, subdivision regulations are typically distinct uh, from the zoning ordinance, and uh, they specify the rules for creating a new lot, uh, which is of course an important part of the process of uh, building new homes. And then there are, there are building codes which have to do with life safety issues, um, with uh, fire issues, uh, but also with uh, energy uh, conservation. And then finally, there are different sorts of environmental regulations that may affect what you can do with wetlands or steep slopes um, or with terrain modification. Um, there are some regulations that are municipal and some that are state level and some that are federal. So in New Hampshire, uh, this is mostly municipal. Uh, at the state level, you do have a permitting process for terrain modification. And then of course, there are federal wetlands and endangered species regulations. And of course, the, the goal of my presentation, not to say that all of these are bad, but these are different types of regulations that we will encounter uh, that can have an impact on the housing supply. We should also think about other things we may not think about initially as regulations, but that can still affect housing supply. So there's public land ownership. That can be important in certain parts of the state. Uh, there are some towns where the, the large majority of the land area 
um, is owned by the federal government. It's part of the White Mountain National Forest. Um, sometimes towns will, will buy easements or buy land as a way of, of protecting it from development. And then there are tax subsidies as well for not developing their land for the current use program. There are different roles in New Hampshire for planning and zoning boards. Um, to oversimplify, planning boards are generally uh, the ones who set um, the policies. Uh, they, they write the zoning ordinance uh, and, and propose amendments to it. And the zoning board can uh, provide variances when those are reasonable. So allow a, a landowner to do something that is not um, technically <coughs> permitted within the zoning ordinance. You can't just measure land use regulation by looking at these zoning ordinances and looking at, at the legal situation in each town because zoning boards are there to provide variances. Planning boards can also have a role in providing approvals for large projects. That Those decisions are not codified, right? There's, a, there's an inherent subjectivity there. Some towns can systematically um, take, make, it, make it easy for landowners to get approvals uh, when it's reasonable. And other towns could make it extremely difficult, require lots of studies and lots of votes and delay things um, so that it's very difficult uh, to build. Uh, two towns with the same zoning ordinance could actually end up with very different uh, regulatory attitudes for housing supply. And so for this study, I'm not going to use features of the zoning ordinance uh, to measure the restrictiveness um, of each town. And I'll show you in a moment how I do, uh, in fact, try to measure that restrictiveness. So there's some examples here of New Hampshire land use regulations. Um, Hanover uh, is going to end up being one of the more restrictive towns in the state. And they uh, prohibit housing even by special exception on nearly half of their land area. And they require a 10 acre minimum lot size on much of the rest. Uh, Manchester is uh, not nearly as, uh, as regulated as Hanover, but there are still some regulations even in the central business district um, prohibiting housing of more than three stories in height. Of course, you can get a, an exception, but you have to apply for that and that's a, a, another cost. Uh, Rye uh, is um, restrictive toward ADUs. They require you to provide two off-street parking spaces uh, for any accessory dwelling unit, even if there's only going to be one person living there, and it bans uh, detached ADUs. Forsmith has a very detailed uh, regulatory code, uh, historic downtown and character districts, each of which overlays and adds to the regulations of the regular zoning districts, as I mentioned, commercial and industrial. And they specify detailed aesthetic features of the buildings and properties, such as the pitch of roofs, the size of the yards, and appearance of facades. Um, East Kingston is a town that actually just says, we're not only going to allow so many building permits to be issued per year. And if we've issued that number, no one else for the rest of the year can build anything. And there are many more examples. What are the effects of, of residential land use regulation here? I'm, I'm, I'm relying mostly on the research that's been done by others. Uh, this is a very popular topic among economists now because it's a problem not just here but around the country and even in other parts of the world. Generally, uh, when you make it more costly to build new housing, you're going to reduce the supply and that's going to increase the cost of housing, uh, especially when there's growing demand. And that's going to drive workers away. Uh, it could benefit some incumbent homeowners who see their, their wealth rise because their houses are now uh, more valuable especially if they want to move to eventually to a, a lower cost area. But it does drive workers away and it makes it uh, more costly to hire workers because they don't want to move to a place uh, that has expensive housing. So um, the economists have found that as a result of this, uh, there's a misallocation of workers around the U.S. economy, and that reduces our GDP. Um, so even reducing land use regulations from their highest level in places like San Francisco and Boston to, uh, uh, to the national average level uh, is estimated to increase US GDP about 10%. So our, our economy is about 10% smaller than it would be um, if we did not have these more exclusionary and restrictive uh, regulations. Um, there's research on how uh, residential land use regulation affects the property tax burden, something you sometimes hear in New Hampshire that we, we care a lot about property property taxes and maybe restricting housing as a way to keep our property tax burden low. Actually, the national evidence suggests that's not the case, um, that residential land use regulation does not reduce the property tax burden. There's even a study in Massachusetts, a pretty similar state, 
in a lot of ways, um, they find that uh, this regulation actually increases the property tax burden because it results in reassessments. Why don't we know about that? It just happens statewide. It results in reassessments. And um, through a cognitive illusion, people see their tax burden falling because the tax rate falls. And so it allows them actually to not reduce that tax rate by, just, by quite as much uh, to actually increase the effective tax burden and use that extra money to spend. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, raising the, the, the value of housing by restricting what anyone can build can actually increase the property tax burden. Uh, we, and there's consistent evidence that uh, residential land use uh, restrictions increase racial and socioeconomic segregation, um, especially across a metropolitan area from between different municipalities within a metropolitan area. And that results in increases in um, social and economic status, educational gaps. So in other words, kids from richer families do much better educationally in terms of testing outcomes and kids from poorer families in those metropolitan areas that have more restrictive zoning. So when you have less restrictive zoning, you don't see such a big educational gap by socioeconomic status. Um, here's a, I just applauded uh, residential building restrictions on the x-axis and state price parities is cost of living. And you see an extremely strong relationship by state. Um, so the more restrictive your land use regulation, the more costly is housing in your, or is not just housing, everything. Your total cost of living is higher in your state. Here's New Hampshire right here. So relatively restrictive, relatively expensive. Zoning and migration, the, the more residential building restrictions you have as a state, the lower is your net migration rate. In fact, the most restrictive states tend to have net out migration, more people moving out of the state to other states than moving into the state from other states. Um, and this relationship is actually even stronger in causal terms than it appears here because places that have a lot of in-migration also tend to be the ones that then start regulating more. So a history of migration positively affects regulation, and then regulation in turn negatively affects uh, migration. So this, the true causal effect is quite a bit steeper here. Um, so if you want to drive people away from your state, residential building regulations are, are a good way to do that. Um, zoning and per capita income, there's a positive relationship here. So if you have stricter building restrictions, you have higher per capita income by state. Does this mean that uh, your economy is more productive because you have more zoning? No, that's not what's happening here. Remember, people are moving away from these states. People are moving away from richer states to poorer states right now in the US. Why are they doing that? Because the richer states are more costly. So what you're doing, you're raising your per capita income by driving away middle and, and lower income families, reducing your population. It's not, you're not growing your economy by, uh, by implementing these uh, building restrictions, but what you are doing is segregating the, the country more by income. So why do um, towns adopt restrictive zoning? Well, there are three different um, explanations out there, uh, roughly speaking, for, for why we have zoning at all. Uh, one is uh, good housekeeping zoning, and this is simply the sort of traditional classic form of zoning uh, that was more prevalent from the 20s to the 60s in which, um, of, the, of the last century, in which uh, the whole idea is to separate uh, residential uses from industrial uses. So there's not gonna be a factory next to a neighborhood, unless you wanna build a neighborhood where there's a factory. Um, you're, you're typically in traditional zoning allowed to do that. We don't allow to build a factory where there's already houses. Um, so that is simply something that, that homeowners may demand as a way of kind of getting some amenities and having, a, having some peace and quiet in their neighborhood. That type of zoning we can have a discussion about is less controversial than the next two. Fiscal zoning is intended to reduce the property tax burden. Right? So we're going we're gonna to zone so that anyone who moves into the town is going to pay their fair share of property taxes. And, and there are ways to do this, like minimum size of house and things like that. So if you're gonna move in, you're gonna be getting a rich, you know, sort of property. You're gonna pay a lot in property taxes and that's gonna cover the cost of any services that you require, perhaps kids in schools and things like that. And then number three, uh, rent seeking and exclusionary zoning. This is um, zoning where we see people wanna to move to our town. 
we can really jack up the prices of our houses if we just don't allow anyone to build. So people wanting to move in, they're just going to bid up the, the value of our houses, and we're going to we're going to make a lot of money as, as homeowners. Um, and maybe the side benefit of this, maybe we, we keep those people out of our neighborhoods, out of our schools. Um, so this can be allied with racist and classist um, motivations. And there's some political science research suggesting that um, a lot of these zoning districts were um, uh, aligned with uh, racial uh, covenants so that they were the more restricted area was a place that had previously been restricted to whites only. So as a way of keeping that area whites only, we're not going to have any multifamily housing or, or small houses there. Um, okay, so those are some motivations for, for zoning. Um, this is a simple supply and demand model that shows how you can have two different supply curves here in different towns. So one town might have more restrictive zoning, another town is less restrictive zoning. They both see a similar increase in demand, more people demanding houses. This one sees less building, less quantity, but higher prices than this one. And so what we should expect is we're going to see lower growth and higher prices for a given type of house in those places that have more restrictive zoning. So that's going to be the key insight for how I try to measure restrictive zoning here in New Hampshire. But here's my method. I'm going to run through this quickly. I, I realize it's a little complex. This comes out of, it's actually peer reviewed in uh, political geography. I took this method, updated it, and applied it to, to New Hampshire. Uh, so the method is I took all the single family house sales in New Hampshire from 1998 to July 2021. And I estimated a model of what each house should cost given its features, square footage, lot size, uh, age, um, I can't remember all the features right now, whether it qualifies for current use, things like that, uh, bedrooms, bathrooms. And then I uh, subtract the predicted price from that equation that I estimate from the actual price. So that measures how much more the house sold for or less that the house sold for than it should have given its characteristics uh, compared to an average house in, in the whole state. Period. And then I average that uh, estimate by town. So that gets the excess price by town. So uh, taking an equivalent house and putting it in Hanover or Portsmouth or Rye or Manchester or Nashua, what would that house cost in that town? Um, and that allows me to get some estimates there. Now, it could be that all of that excess price is simply driven by restrictive housing supply. Right? And that some places are more expensive than others simply because um, supply is restricted. But we know that demand actually varies. You know, there, there are places where the demand is growing, like Southern New Hampshire, there are places where demand has, has been uh, falling or stagnant, like much of the Lost County. Um, so then what I do is I look at, and this is the more complex part, I look at um, how, how demand correlates with excess price, and then I kind of net out the effect of demand coming from population growth. Um, and so then I get the uh, predicted um, uh, excess price, subtract that from the actual excess price to get house price inelasticity. Okay, <laughs> more details uh, in, in, the, in the paper, and we can talk about that later if you want. Um, this kind of shows how it works. This is excess price and population growth by town, and I pulled out the towns that have no zoning at all, and those are important for estimating what the relationship would be between population growth um, and excess price. So we do see a positive relationship. So if you're growing faster, um, then you do see more expensive housing just because the, the building can't keep up. Um, but it's a pretty flat relationship. It's not super, super strong here. So um, a lot of the excess price seems to be driven by um, residential land use regulations or other housing supply inelasticity. So you know, a place like New London, <laughs> an extreme example where population has been falling but it's way more expensive than the average town. So why? <laughs> um, the only explanation seems to be that housing supply is being limited in some way. Um, other towns like Newington, Rye, Newcastle, right? Uh, their population is actually not growing or growing very slowly, but housing is super expensive there. 
So the demand isn't actually huge there, but um, but the, the prices are super high, and that implies that the supply uh, is not allowed to grow. Here's a map of this housing supply inelasticity measure. So I think this is a good proxy for regulation, and it seems to be a good proxy for regulation when I do this kind of thing nationally. But um, but there are other factors like public land ownership, steep slopes and wetlands, and things like that 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 may uh, also contribute to uh, inability to build. Um, and you see that. You know, this map is very dark, lots of, lots of regulation down here in the seacoast area, right? This Newcastle, of course, with Rye area, especially, but really all of the seacoast is pretty uh, restrictive. Um, and maybe in general, the southeast part of the state, uh, as well as around the lakes area, around Dartmouth College, and a little bit in the White Mountains. And the places that are least restricted are sort of from Cheshire County up through Sullivan County, inland. Grafton County, away from the Connecticut River, and much of Coos County. Um, and then, if you look in in southern New Hampshire, you see this sort of fits with what we expect. You see towns like Hollis and Wyndham looking quite a bit more regulated uh, than towns like um, Hooksett and Ware and Dunbarton and Mount Vernon. Um, so that that seems to, I think, fit with what most people uh, think. So there's some base validity uh, to this measure. Now, what are the consequences of this restrictive land use regulation? Now I can take this measure that I've got by town and look at how it statistically correlates with other outcomes of interest. So one is income segregation. So I look at um, housing regulation, I, I average it by different, um, different years. So I've got the average from 97 to 06, at the sort of beginning of my data set. And then I look at uh, the change in the median household income over the next 15 years, 2000 to 2015. And I see a positive relationship. So if you're more regulated at the beginning of this century, you, you become richer in the sense that your median household income rises. And if your regulation is less at the start of this century, then your median income falls. What this means is, um, the, again, we saw that the most regular towns aren't growing fast. It's just like at the state level, the towns that have the highest regulation here um, are becoming richer because they're driving out lower income households who then have to move to the towns that have less regulation. And so you would get more dispersion in income, the richer areas, uh, which often started out with stricter land use regulation, becoming richer, but, um, but smaller or not growing. And the population tending to go to um, the towns that are, that are relatively uh, lower income. Um, so we're getting more dispersion now of, of income across towns as a result of housing regulation. Uh, some numbers just to show that I control for some things here and, and find that this, um, this variable regulation is extremely more than 99.9% .9 statistically significant even when I control for lots of other things that could be affecting change in household income. So what causes uh, regulation? Why are uh, towns adopting this if it's limiting population growth, limiting businesses' ability to expand, causing income segregation, does not seem to actually reduce the property tax burden. <laughs> so it also seems to be all these negatives to this residential land use regulation. So why are towns doing it? Um, one could be simply rent seeking. They want to raise the value of homes um, so that you can sell and move to Florida and your money goes a long way because you made a lot of money on your, your house, bought it for 150K and now it's 500K and, and just pocket the, the difference. That may be part of it. Um, but uh, statistically, what do we see? What, which, why do some towns um, become stricter than others? So I do find some relationships here and it's hard to, to be completely talking about causality, but towns that adopted zoning earlier or experienced greater population growth uh, between 1970 and 1990 and towns that either highly rural or highly urban tend to have the strictest uh, regulations. So these are like your suburbs, your inner ring suburbs tend to be more restrictive than either the center city or the, the rural areas. Um, the towns that, um, that really had a lot of experience with these, with these zoning instruments that adopted it soon after the Enabling Act in 1926 uh, and towns that have this migration, okay. Uh, then I also look at things like partisanship. There's a weak relationship, but towns that were a little bit, uh, that were a lot more Republican in 2000 are a little bit more regulated. Um, towns that are less dense than our neighbors and whose neighbors were more regulated in 98 to 06 
increase their regulations more between 98 and 2021, right? So I look at change in regulations here. So it looks as if um, all else equal, if you were a more Republican town, you probably increased your regulations more than towns were more democratic. Um, if, you're, if your neighbors are more densely populated, you're more likely to increase. Whereas if your neighbors are less densely populated, you're gonna decrease regulations and maybe not increase them. And again, uh, if your neighbors are more regulated to start the period, you're more likely to increase. Okay, so it's so a quick set of findings there. And that suggests that, um, that there's a little bit of this uh, race to the bottom or race, maybe race to lots of regulation where it, as towns increase their regulations, neighbors respond by increasing their, their own. Uh, partisanship has a small effect on regulation. So this, you see this line here is positive, but fairly flat. This is Republican vote in 2000 and 2002, statewide races. This is change in regulation over the next 20 years. This is it's a pretty noisy relationship. We shouldn't think that partisanship is driving most of this as a small effect. Density is an upside down U-shaped relationship. So, um, you know, it's going to be towns like Seabrook and Darien, Salem, Hampton Falls, and Ryan, Newcastle, and Coastal. Numbers worth those are the towns that increase their housing regulation. Um, and it's the, you know, National Manchester, if not as much as those uh, <coughs> more suburban type towns now. Uh, towns that had, that adopted zoning very early tended to increase housing regulation a lot. Right? So, some of these are actually fairly rural towns like Hanover. But adopted zoning very early, suggesting that for them zoning wasn't really about managing this conflict between industrial and residential, this good housekeeping zoning, but maybe even early on it had a kind of growth control and a population kind of motive. Um, so originally managing problems of density in cities was a major motivation for zoning, um, although it's worth pointing out that in Europe, uh, which has a lot of dense cities, they don't do zoning, uh, they do land use regulation, but they don't do this kind of arbitrary division of the city into this kind of maybe arbitrary is not the right word, but like rigid division of the city into different districts. Um, but that was a major uh, motivation in the US. Uh, but some less dense towns adopted zoning enthusiastically just to limit growth. And that really spread in the 1970s. Uh, and we see that in the 70s and 80s, New Hampshire got a lot of growth. Those towns that got more growth and more restrictions. That makes sense with the rent seeking model, right? If you're gonna see people move into your town, that's lots of demand. That can restrict supply and the value of these homes is gonna go up quite a lot. And then we get this ratchet effect in neighboring jurisdictions. So, this, so maybe there's a role for state government here because towns are maybe adopting more regulation than even they want, but they're responding to their neighbors. Losers from the status quo include landowners, employers, residents in towns near ones that tighten the construction industry, people with respiratory illnesses because of the long commutes that people have uh, to get to the city, often having to live in rural areas. Uh, those workers that have longer commutes and have higher cost of living, children from families of lower income that can't get into towns with better schools, retirees wanting to downsize. So this is a, a list of people who uh, probably would benefit from relaxing some of the most restrictive regulations. And so I have a few policy recommendations here in the interest of time. I won't go too deeply into them right now, but um, at the local level, you could do things like reform the zoning ordinance. So relax the minimum lot size setback, single family only, minimum parking, maximum height restrictions, allow residential and commercial zones. These are things that localities can do right now to uh, increase housing supply. Uh, and if they are going to try to uh, make development pay its way, um, my view is it's better to use impact fees and, and make the developer pay a price for the, the cost to the town of like maybe moving a road, moving utilities, than it is to just ban the development outright. Um, let's actually um, establish a kind of price, if you will, uh, for the right to develop. Uh, at the state level, you can do things like a regulatory takings compensation law. Arizona has one that seems to be very, very effective in limiting exclusionary zoning. Uh, you can allow a regional compact, so you can let municipalities voluntarily join these regional compacts for planning and zoning. That might also help with that arms race issue. You can allow towns, this is a new trade idea maybe, but a lot of um, uh, law professors and economists are talking about it now. Maybe allow towns to decentralize zoning authority to neighborhoods and blocks. Maybe even more local would actually help. Um, we don't know, but maybe it would help because 
uh, the it's hard for one little neighborhood to then exclude, you know, have an exclusionary motive for um, for everyone, given that a neighboring neighborhood could go precisely the opposite direction is going to completely get rid of your uh, uh, motive there, you know, obviate your, your attempt to, to exclude and that the nearby neighborhood can, can include. Um, you can, this is more like mollifying one of the educational consequences of exclusionary zoning. You can allow um, uh, students to go across districts. Um, you could uh, sort of open enrollment. You can allow, um, you could conduct more research at the state level, the effects of zoning regulations. You can look at stream, streamlining terrain modification permits for DES, something we've heard from, uh, from developers. Um, keep the Housing Appeals Board and maybe streamline <coughs> approval at the local level. Uh, reduce the time that it takes to get uh, a permit approved. All right, so that's a lot of that's sort of fire hose of information, but I, I wanted to stay uh, strictly within in my time. So thank you very much. Okay. So uh, just in the interest of time, because we're running a little bit behind, we're going to we'll go right to the panel discussion and then have all questions uh, at the end of the panel discussion for Jason or for the panel. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, so, real quickly, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to introduce our panel really quickly. Uh, so, Jason, obviously, you know, uh, Sarah Marchow, who is the Community Development Director in the city of Nashua. Mm -hmm. So, and Ben Frost, who's a uh, Policy Director at, uh, is that the Of course not. I know it's, it's longer than that, but I always, <laughs> I'm a policy guy. But I, so, as soon as you say policy, you, yeah, I stop. So, um, at New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. And uh, we're very excited to have both of you here because these are real experts on this issue. And we wanted to um, you know, broaden the discussion a little bit. So I think in the interest of moderating the discussion, it, I don't know if this is awkward, but maybe I'll just stand. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and start off our conversation here. And I wanna start by just getting the two of you to react to the report. So I think I'll start with Sarah first. And just give us your impressions. What did you think? How does this um, confirm or conflict with any of your experiences? I think the report did a great job of pointing out a lot of things that are kind of known to some of us who live um, in these regulations. Um, and it's, it's it's wonderful to see some real data, I think, behind things that we talk about a lot and that have been hard to quantify in the past. Um, I think one of the things that this report points out very clearly is, um, you know, our biggest building growth was really between the 70s and 80s in across the state. And that's when a lot of our zoning was adopted, especially in the smaller communities, a lot of more rural communities. And at that time, it was an aversion to change, which is still very much true today. Um, and it's very much about a protecting the value of your own property. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I see from people who show up at meetings or who come to argue against changes to zoning is a fear of loss of the value of their biggest asset. And that drives a tremendous amount of who shows up and people's concerns about what is going on with regulations and what we call NIMBYism, right? Um, and I think a lot of this data really points to the fact of by letting NIMBYism lead our decision process, what those outcomes have become. And I think that this report does a really nice job kind of putting some of that um, into context. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective. And I just want to say from the broad center's point of view, um, our, our mission here and our goal here is again, not to abolish something, not to take this stuff away as a tool. Um, we totally understand that people have concerns about the value of their homes and also about the, the community and the life in their community. Um, and one of the effects of these regulations, I think that Jason and Sarah just pointed out is, the way I look at it is you've kind of frozen your community in the 70s with a lot of these regulations. So there were certain um, community types and designs and housing policies and preferences that existed in the 70s and 80s and, and late 60s when these regulations were written and they have frozen that rigidly in time. And it, you know, 40, 50 years later, it makes it harder for people to change and, and, and uh, express their own preferences through the housing that they'd like to have right now. And so relaxing that a little bit and letting people have some both and is kind of where we're going here. 
Uh, ben, what do you think? Well, I, I agree with what Sarah says, uh, and, and want to thank Jason for bringing this this national body of research to bear on the New Hampshire context. Uh, it's something we've been waiting for for a long time. Uh, the, the conclusions are not surprising. Uh, they're the kind of conclusions we would have come to ourselves. Uh, but it, it, I think in an effort to uh, essentially quantify uh, these relationships. Uh, this is really important uh, groundbreaking research for, for New Hampshire. Um, I, I especially appreciate, although it really focuses on the quantitative relationships, uh, the reference that Jason made to the process as well. It's not just the regulations, but the process that local boards use that uh, really tie things up. So I love that term, study purgatory. <laughs> and, and so I, I chair my own council planning board. And so I recognize how easy it is for even the best intention boards to uh, fall into that kind of uh, dynamic with uh, applicants who appear before them. Because if you, if you don't have sufficient training in the, the field that uh, you're supposed to be regulating these things, if you don't even understand your own zoning ordinance and your regulations that you're, that you're supposed to be enforcing, uh, then you're not gonna be able to effectively uh, provide uh, guidance to an applicant if you want to provide guidance to an applicant. And to come to a good and efficient decision on an application. Uh, lots of boards fall into that, that, that uh, meeting after meeting after meeting, iterative process, getting through, slogging through an application. Uh, and and <coughs> that's where we have sufficient, a lot of room for improvement in, in how boards conduct their work. So I'm going to start with you then. Jason had mentioned some of the um, regulations that can get excessive and cause problems. Can you give us some examples? Um, you know, there were lot size and requirements and setbacks, and maybe talk a little bit about your experience, what you've sure. seen, just in some anecdotes to go with this. So I, I've been a, a planner in New Hampshire since the mid nineties and was a planner in other jurisdictions. So prior to that, New York, Maine, um, I, I was a town planner in Kittery, uh, Maine in the late eighties. And what I say is it's not my fault. <laughs> uh, but I, th I think you know what we see common to uh, zoning ordinances in particular, but also site plan regulations and subdivision regulations, uh, town after town, state after state, they're all using the same formulas. Uh, at least those um, those communities that adopted the regulations in 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, there's some some newer things that are coming on, which are great, but frontage. So the amount of street frontage that is required for each lot is an enormous cost driver. So, and, and it, it's often used to say, well, we need, you know, need, need to get access to the lot. Well, yeah, but a fire truck isn't 200 feet wide. <laughs> fire trucks have a certain width. They have to travel on the roads too. So you don't really need 200 feet to provide adequate access to a lot. That instead is really, uh, that sort of standard is, is used to, uh, preserve rural character. Yeah. When it, that is the last thing it does. It yeah. chews up the countryside and, and puts house after house spread 200, 300, 400 feet apart. And, and as a consequence, drives up municipal costs because services have to be provided for longer distances for each individual residence. So frontage is one. Setbacks are, is another huge cost driver. So you focused on New London, which by the way, is actually trying to do something about the cost of housing in their community, uh, but they're, they're faced with a significant problem. A significant problem they have is the standards of their zoning ordinance. So if you wanna do uh, multi-family development in New London, say you get a, a three acre lot, uh, after you apply all the standards to that three acre lot, you're left with something less than a half an acre of buildable envelope because of the setbacks that are required, the buffer that is required. I don't know what is so visually offensive about a multifamily dwelling uh, that has to be invisible from the street and from anyone except from the air, <laughs> doing it by drone. So those are two examples, there are lots of others. <clears throat> those are great examples and they apply, I mean, you can find this out if you've ever, if you're a homeowner and you've ever, ever tried to add a shed to your, <laughs> to your lot. Um, the setback requirements, uh, you know, add the cost. You can't just go down to Lowe's and, and buy a, you know, a shed and put it on your land. You have to get approval. You have to make sure it's set back a certain amount of feet, and you can't put it wherever you want. And that's how 
incredibly restrictive these things can get. And um, I always like to point out, I'm glad you mentioned the, the setback requirements and the funding requirements. Um, I think one thing that's important to recognize, as Jason pointed out, these zoning was, uh, rules were allowed in 1926 for the first time in the nation. They didn't exist. There's no such thing as zoning before uh, the progressive era in the early 20th century. And that's why a lot of the quaint New England towns that make New Hampshire so picturesque that draw residents, that draw tourists, that really drive our economy in a large sense. You look at the Lakes region, you look at the cute little towns like Amherst Village, you look at Portsmouth. There's no furniture set back in, in downtown Portsmouth. The houses are right up on the sidewalk and they're beautiful and they're super expensive and they're in high demand because a lot of people want to live like that. That's the New England that we have literally made illegal in New Hampshire with a lot of these excessive regulations. And I think thinking about it that way, um, that if we roll back some of these, it's not going to turn us into New York City or Boston. That's not the goal. And that's not what it would lead to. It may let us get back to old New Hampshire in a lot of ways. So um, do you have some examples from Nashua that you can talk about, um, See, issues that you've dealt with? So, um Kind of what you're talking about is again, um, it's it's a new model of thinking, right? And adopting new technologies, and it's really looking at things through a form-based code instead of a use regulation, which is what zoning more is. And um, as as we've gone through this process, as I said, you know, 70s and 80s, we originally adopted regulations that would have, that essentially outlawed the little downtowns that we love. And what people have learned over time is that if we really focus on the form, if you go out and measure the form of your neighborhood. And allow for that to be built that's where you get back to the quality of the development and form that feels like home and feels like a community but can you define that a little bit for people who aren't familiar? sure so uh so for example in um in parts of in different neighborhoods in nashua and there's there's two parts i want to get here um you can go out and you could look on a neighborhood in the core downtown right nashua was originally a mill city and you could look and you could literally were in aerial photography you can literally draw a line and the whole neighborhood has porches that are six feet from the sidewalk, right? And so you have a, an area that is more of a build to line instead of a setback, saying that all development in this neighborhood to match the form of this neighborhood needs to be built to within zero and 10 feet of the front setback line, but preferably along this six foot line that matches the form of the neighborhood, right? We're less concerned with the frontage or the setback. We want you to build to the line that forms with the neighborhood. Right, so focusing on form. We're also less concerned than if um, how many units are in that building, as long as the building feels the same to the person who's driving down the street or walks down the first seat. So with form-based codes, you really you regulate the public space, mm -hmm. and what happens behind private is private, and you do that to make a form that feels comfortable. That's interesting. So you're saying that communities could say um, instead of saying, "Well, we won't allow." Um, healthy family unit, or we won't allow uh, residential above retail here, as long as the building looks in character with the rest of the neighborhood, as long as it fits visually on the outside, you can kind of do with it what you want on the inside. Is that more or less what we're talking about? That's, yeah. yes, a very high level of what we're talking about. So in Nashua, in our downtown zone, we have that flexibility. We have some basic standards that talk about what you have to meet. And if you meet all these standards, you don't go to planning board. Um, you skip that and go directly to building the process. And we've been using that pretty successfully, um, especially just in the last year or two, we have more and more properties coming in like that because much of our downtown number one is set, right? It's already paved. You're not gonna, there's not a lot of changes that need to happen. And a lot of those properties were built before we had zoning, and before we had site plans, and to subject them to a whole process of planning board review for what's already on the ground and existing, which is our main street is what people love. It, it's all unnecessary, right? And so if you can meet the form that's there and you can meet the facade standards, right? I mean, we, we know some basic things, facade standards. Um, we don't want a hundred foot long brick wall, right? You can't fill in all the windows. That would not work. That doesn't feel safe. It doesn't feel like it's a good part of the public space. But if you can meet the basic standards that make it feel like that part of the neighborhood, then you can go right to building permit. And you don't have to go through that public hearing process and public process. How, how does someone um, apply to do that? Is it a checklist that they have that basically says, okay, here our building is going to look like this? 
their dimensions, here's the plan, and then it's kind of a checkbox and they don't have to go through the rest of the process. It is, it's essentially kind of a checklist process that you fill out saying that you meet the basic standards, you submit the plans. There is still the internal review to make sure your sewer hookups, your stormwater hookups and everything work. Um, we, so, right, so we're still talking to public works. We're still talking to fire marshal to make sure that you're uh, meet those basic standards for life safety that are essential. But yes, it's just, it's an internal checklist process and it's a lot faster. Um, and it, you don't have to involve quite as many people. The other, um, the other thing we've tried to do to be a bit innovative is in um, some of our districts that we were trying to really encourage new development. Some of our old mill districts or industrial districts where you haven't seen a lot of investment in 100, 150 years is we've created this kind of overlay district that has incredible flexibility in density, in frontage, in setbacks. And in theory, you write a suitability analysis of why this works in the neighborhood for these uses. And it's just a trip to the planning board to basically move an application through. Um, and so those have been very efficient ways to allow flexibility because we don't know what the market's bringing. And we don't know exactly what fits on this piece that's been a factory for 150 years, right? And probably needs environmental cleanup and has a lot of other costs associated with it. And so if we can come to the table with enough data and facts about what you want to do there and how that flexibility is, what fits, then we're not concerned if it's, you know, 30 units or 80 units or 150 units of housing, um, as long as we can meet all the basic life safety standards. That's an interesting way to do it. Um, sure. I, I, we recently wrote about the Barlett Center. Um, I think this is a good example of the rigid rule um, of a zone getting in the way of change. Um, a lot of you might be familiar with uh, Portsmouth. I, I forget the street that it's on, um, but there's a there's a abandoned Getty gas station in Portsmouth as you're leaving downtown. And you would think it's Portsmouth. It's probably the most valuable um, acre per acre square footage uh, property in the, that, that part of town in the state, among the most valuable. And yet there's a gas station that has literally been abandoned for years sitting there on this incredibly valuable land. Why is that? Well, it turns out that the regulations in the zone cap, they, they so strictly limit what it can be used for that there have been multiple developers and business entrepreneurs who've come in and proposed using that gas station as a restaurant, you know, planning board keeps turning it down. They would rather have an abandoned gas station than a restaurant that seats more than 50 people because the code says 50 is all you can have. So if you have 60 seating, seats, no matter how you configure them, that's not a lot. And so you literally have an eyesore abandoned gas station still sitting there years later in Portland. And that's just an example of how um, you could say, look, if it fits the neighborhood, We'll allow you to change it. I mean, so there are options, there are different ways of doing it. Uh, Nashua has, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in, in the last few years built a lot of new apartments. Um, can you, that, that seems to be a major issue in New Hampshire. Um, how did that happen? Yeah, we've had over 600 units built in the, in the downtown in uh, the past five years, maybe more. Um, we have some great partners in the community, right? Nashua doesn't build anything. Yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> we, have some, we have some great investors. Um, in the community, we have um, we've had an over um, let's see, we have 210, 250, so half of those are affordable units. Um, and so we've had some really great um, people who want to come in and invest in the downtown, who are willing to work with us and work with different funding sources like from New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority and other groups um, to really reinvest in property. Um, and so most of those have come through this site plan suitability process, right? We try to make not go to the zoning board and the planning board to be able to build what we need to build. Um, we've been very flexible on height and density. Again, we're not concerned if it's 100 units or 150 units. There's a lot of economics of scale that play into what you can actually afford to build, where there's a return on investment. And by us not necessarily saying you can only have 80 units here, that actually allows you to get the return on investment that you need to make the investment in the community. And so our flexibility, I think, has definitely contributed to that. We're also out there saying, we want you to come here. Our, we have an amazing community and we really want to invest in new people, all new people in our community. And so we need people at the high end of the market and we need to provide housing for the people at the lower end of the market as well. And all of that we know contributes to the best community. 600 new units in five years is, is tremendous. Uh, one of the things I've been struck with 
about the cities in New Hampshire. When I moved to New Hampshire in the early 2000s, so more than 20 years ago now, um, Manchester was about 110,000 people. Manchester is still about 110,000. I, I just, that boggles my mind. And one of the reasons is it's incredibly hard to get an apartment complex built or a, a, a new building or even um, you know, two single family homes in, in that city. And if you can't build, then you're not going to grow. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about. You mentioned single family zoning. I think that's just kind of um, what I hear when people react to us talking about zoning is, oh my God, you're going to destroy my neighborhood. You're going to build an apartment complex right next to my house. <coughs> and uh, I just want to be clear that's not what we're talking about. But um, there are some issues with single family zoning. And I'll just bring up some examples. I mean, if you can go to the county of New Hampshire where you have neighborhoods that are small ranches or small capes and they're on a half acre lot or 0.75 acre lot and these great little communities and then they stop and then you have two acre lots and two acre lots and then four acre lots and so can you just talk a little bit about how that works in the in the maybe the lot size so even if you do if you even if you say we're going to keep this area single family you're not going to allow multi-family in it um, what are some of the things that exist in single family uh, you know, zones that might be getting in the way of, of people finding more housing and building? I'll throw it to, to Ben if you want to. Sure. Well, I, I think the, the fact of uh, single family only zoning mm -hmm. is a, a, an important issue for us to be discussing in New Hampshire. We see in, in other jurisdictions, you know, that, you know, um, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, in Portland, Oregon, that they've been essentially outlawing single family only, only zoning. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily the best solution, but come up with better standards for single family development, allow more effective use of the ADE law, the accessory mm -hmm. quality unit law, to allow for detached ADUs, which can fit really well in a fairly compact uh, environment. So you look at, um, and I love the expression, you feel like home. <coughs> so if, if, you, if you look at things that you like, and I'm, I'm, for some reason, I was recalling the, the movie Halloween, the original movie Halloween. <laughs> I saw in the theaters as a kid. I remember, one of the opening scenes is Jamie Lee Curtis with her, her friend driving around this town. And I remember as a kid thinking, these look like really nice neighborhoods. Now, so that's why I'm doing the kind of work I do now. I <laughs> <laughs> but it felt like home. And that was really what the filmmakers were going for. And that's where planning boards should be going for it as well. What feels like home? How do you get to something that feels good when you're walking down the sidewalk or driving down the street or living in your home, sitting on the porch, looking out at your neighborhood? What feels like home? And among those things are allowing backyard cottages, which we call accessory dwelling units. So you allow for more efficient use of the existing infrastructure, the roads, the water, the sewer lines. Uh, at really no additional cost to a community without any public investment. It's not publicly subsidized. It's something that the property owner can do on their own properties. So that's a very simple change to the existing zoning structure that we have here in New Hampshire, allowing the matched agencies. Yeah, okay, so we're gonna have to wrap up. Um, I just want to take a few minutes and we have, we can take a few oh, questions. Yeah, that's what we wanted to do. Yeah. Take a few so, questions. Yeah. Great. So um, I saw Dan was signed up first. Okay, thank you. So I live in a town of roughly 5,000 people and um, and I have been on planning board a number of times. And, and what we're definitely afraid of is that a family with two kids moves into town and adds $30,000 to our costs of schools and pay $7,500 of taxes, all right? So that's a negative. <laughs> and I, it seems like the suggestion you have to, to deal with this number seven, and that's statewide open enrollment in public schools. Is there, what is that? And, and is, there, is there any way to fix this format? Yeah, yeah. I and mean, this is still an issue we're working on, but other states have, have looked at this and would allow, um, students to go to schools outside their districts. And of course, in New Hampshire, schools are, are mostly locally funded. And so you can have different spending rates in different towns. And so you want to, you wouldn't want it to be possible for um, 
uh, a family that's strategically located in a low tax town and send their kid to a school in a high tax town that spends a lot on the school, right? So what you could do is then um, uh, require the sending town to pay the receiving town um, what it pays on a per student basis, and then the, the family can make up the difference uh, with what the receiving town spends per student. That's kind of the, the high level overview of how that might work uh, in the New Hampshire um, environment, but this is uh, this is an idea we, we still have to really flesh out. Um, you know, I would point out that uh, that the research that's been done on multifamily housing shows that uh, it doesn't actually bring in a lot of kids. Uh, it's often for these smaller apartments, usually singles or young couples, retired people sometimes. Uh, so not you don't get a lot of kids with that. Um, and then the other the other part of it is that the vast majority of New Hampshire towns, you know, mine is an example of declining enrollments. And so uh, adding a new uh, student actually might not affect your property taxes at all. It, it almost certainly won't. New Hampshire, for those of you who don't know, in the last 13 years has lost 25,000 houses. That's how far the, the enrollments drop. In most towns, um, even small towns, the enrollment has gone down by hundreds in just the last few years. So if you were to build a apartment, apartment complex and every single unit was filled with a child, you still wouldn't make up the number of kids you lost in the last probably five years in most towns. So um, it's a myth that uh, it's gonna that kids are gonna drive up your tax rate. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah, Jason, uh, I'm looking at this from a business approach. I'm, I'm working on an initiative to build sustainable uh, housing for our millennial population. Um, so from a business person's perspective, my concern is we are in danger that we'll lose the millennial population. They'll go south. And the, uh, the Pitcos and the other companies in New Hampshire uh, will follow them since the largest part of our revenue is business profits tax. Had you looked at, or can you look at, if we lose this millennial population, what does that do to the level of our business profits tax would just then turn the whole state taxing system? You'll see personal income taxes in a heartbeat, not by the presume. Have you looked at, at that piece of the puzzle? I have not, but I mean, businesses do say that this is a major problem with recruiting employees, and of course, the business enterprise tax taxes the wage base, so more businesses can hire in New Hampshire, the, the more revenue the state gets. So I think uh, I think you're concerned in that one. Yeah, and I just would add to that that um, when you look at the polling on what millennials and younger generation uh, want for housing options, they want closer together um, communities. They want to live above or near retail and shops and coffee shops. They they seek. That sort of midway, not a full urban environment, but sort of partway between urban and suburban. Um, they don't want the four bedroom, three garage mansion. They're not looking for that. And that's what a lot of communities have zoned for. I think we just want to know we have some questions online as oh, well. Sure. So maybe we should take one online. Yeah, before. Say that. Sure. So um, one online viewer is wondering um, how allowing neighborhoods to do their own zoning would improve anything, um, because this individual says that they see a bunch of not in our backyards happening. Yeah, I mean, that, that could happen. I mean, the, the argument that uh, is made in the literature is that um, Rent-seeking zoning, zoning only works if you can cover a sufficient territory so that there's not competition between zoning authorities. If you get that competition between zoning authorities where people can easily, oh, you won't let me build? Well, I'll go right next door and build there. Uh, if you can get that um, lots and lots of zoning authorities, uh, then maybe uh, you, you actually end up with less of that kind of rent-seeking type of zoning. I mean, the, the, and the sort of thought experiment would be imagine that it's up to the individual <coughs> property owner <laughs> to determine something, right? But that's effectively no zone. Um, so, so maybe really hyper local zoning would work, but it's we don't we don't know yet, right? This is a this is a hypothesis that's out there and, and being studied right now. Um, yeah, I have a question that's kind of related. I was su uh, surprised to see your recommendation for a regional planning. Um, my perception is that, uh, if anything, that tends to be more restrictive and uh, and reduces the options, you know, for competition between zoning districts. Apparently, moving in the opposite direction. 
So I was curious why why you included that. Yeah, so um, my recommendation is for municipalities to be able to voluntarily create these regional compacts. So they can also withdraw from them. Um, so it wouldn't be mandatory regional planning. Um, and the idea would not necessarily be that the regional um, authority would take over all planning and zoning, but just that um, maybe we all agree together that we're not going to increase minimum lot sizes above two acres or something like that, right? So it's more like a trade agreement between countries, right? So like the World Trade Organization, we all agree we're not going to raise tariffs above this certain percentage. And maybe that makes us all better off because now I don't have to worry, oh, you're, you're jacking your restrictions. I guess we better do it. Otherwise, <coughs> all the development's going to come to us. Um, so that's trying to solve that problem. Um, the Economist Bill official at Dartmouth has found that those states where counties rather than municipalities enjoy zoning authority are less restrictive. So, um, so, so it's maybe there's something about the municipal level that is the wrong level in some ways and that either higher level like county or lower level like neighborhood would be, would be better. That's yeah, a possibility. It's surprising, I would think yeah. that kind of work the other way around. So uh, okay. just to respond to that from the Bartlett Center point of view, uh, this is a subject that Jason and I discussed in the report and I kind of tried to talk into taking it out um, <laughs> but because I have similar concerns about it, but we just thought it was worth including in the report as a, as a discussion item um, based on some of the previous research that have been done. And so um, that's an interesting concept. I would also say many much of the infrastructure we talk about is regional in nature, right? I mean, we're talking right. about transportation corridors to job centers. We're talking about things that make more sense that don't end at municipal boundaries that in some ways can be really helpful at that little bit larger scale. Um, so yeah, I think we have time for one more question. I think I'd like to take an online and if we have another on top. We actually do. Online. Yeah. Um, besides Nashville, which other New Hampshire municipalities are doing a good job balancing regulation and allowing new housing to be built? Is there any role for the state in addressing these issues? I would turn this over to the panel. Well, regarding the, the role of the state, um, I, I think that there is a place for the, the legislature to take action. And specifically, I call out uh, what we, we're calling the, the toolkit bill. So in um, the last legislative session in 2021, there was House Bill 586 which came out of a 2019 task force uh, that Governor Sununin uh, created to look at some solutions to uh, helping address our, our housing crisis. Um, what the toolkit bill will do and, and expect that it will be reintroduced in the 2022 session is provide municipalities with some additional tools uh, to help them with things such as training provided through, through the state. Uh, and think about it, don't you want local boards that are regulating uh, people's property and affecting people's property rights to do so competently to train it. And it's a great concept. Uh, so in addition to that, would also impose some uh, controls on how local courts do their um, uh, permit processing, such as requiring them to produce findings of fact, in particular where they're denying an application. After all, wouldn't you want, as an applicant, to be told why your permit was denied? Findings of fact, not just the fact denied, go figure it out yourself. <laughs> um, and lastly, uh, establish some timelines. There are timelines for planning board uh, action, but to tighten those up a little bit and to provide a, a firm timeline on the zoning board of adjustment decisions. Right now, the ZBA can take as long as it wants to come to a conclusion six months, nine months, a year, on and on and on. This would establish a maximum of 90 days from application. So that's where the state can get involved. Yeah, there are a lot of communities that are doing a good job, some of which haven't gotten there yet. I mentioned New London, one of, the, one of the most expensive communities in the state, one of the most exclusionary communities in the state, but they recognize that. They know they have a problem and they're trying to do something about it. For years, Londonderry was one of the most exclusionary communities in the state. And you know, 15 years ago, they recognized they had a problem. They did something about it. And as a, as a result, we see a lot of development going on, residential development going on in, in uh, London Dairy. And then our cities, Nashua, Keene has really taken some uh, dramatic steps forward in uh, creating a regulatory environment that is conducive to good development. I'm gonna say Dover as well. Uh, I think it's a little bit harder for some of our smaller towns to, to do this because most of the time they don't have staff, right? Most of the communities in New Hampshire are less than 5,000 people. 
and most of the communities less than 5,000 people don't have any planning staff, right? So it's volunteers who don't get training or are not mandated to, who are doing their best, but are coming at it from their own perspective and their own agenda. And many times they're just borrowing what their neighbors stand on campus or what their neighbors do, hence the, hence the kind of growth of this is what my, we should just copy what they did, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there are towns that have some really good ideas, but they don't necessarily have the tools to figure out how to implement those in a way that doesn't create what we have created. Um, in in the, the last 20 years, we've, we've put in a lot of regulations we thought were really great and we've created exactly what we have today, which is two, four, five, six acre zoning. And we're realizing that maybe that isn't the outcome that we wanted. In theory, it sounded like we were preserving rural character, but maybe that's not actually what we've done. And so I think it's, Talking about that and analyzing that and seeing what we can do better is really hard when you just have a volunteer force too. And so you need to invest in our small towns, need to put some investment in them. All right, well, thank you so much. I'm going to turn this over to Max to close it out. Yeah, great. Thank you, Drew. Uh, so I just want to thank um, Jason for a wonderful piece of research and, and really stimulating and insightful. Um, our panelists for their insights and background that uh, added to what Jason presented. Drew for wonderful moderating skills, um, Anna for managing the online uh, program, uh, but all of you for attending and, and for your questions, uh, your support, um, as well as online. I do think it's it's encouraging to see so many people, uh, good minds coming together about this problem of housing in New Hampshire from different walks of life and different experiences, organizations coming together from different perspectives because we all have this problem. So we need to get more uh, community leaders business leaders, uh, legislators, people together to work together to solve this problem. So I'm encouraged and I, I, think, I think we should be hopeful that uh, changes will, will come, create a better regulatory environment for more housing to be built. So thank you all for coming. Thank so it makes sense if you think about where the demand for